Hi, welcome everyone to the Carter Center's uh, roundtable today. And we are discussing the wonderful work of peacemakers um, in Iraq that are working in Iraq. Um, we have just an amazing panel with us today. We are so grateful for the incredible work they are doing. Um, and they're gonna help us understand what's going on, um, what their work is, is hoping to, what they're hoping to achieve with their work and how the public can support them in the great work they're doing. Um, and we know that this is a very, very relevant topic um, right now as the, the conflict is spreading in Iraq, but also in the region more broadly. So we're very interested and grateful for our guests um, today. I'm going to introduce our guests all at the same time, and then I'll go to each of them with questions uh, for them individually. And then we'll have a discussion period, and I hope that our audience uh, we'll stay with us for the full hour. Um, we have Dr. Firas al Kubaisi, who is an Iraqi pediatrician, uh, a pediatric cardiologist, in fact, um, who has been practicing in Fallujah, Iraq for many years. Um, who's not currently in Fallujah, but has, uh, his practice has been based there. Um, he has someone who has seen firsthand the effects of war and has been on the front lines, really, of the healthcare response. Dr. al Kubesi has a unique insider's understanding of what is happening in Iraq and where we should go from here. Uh, when Dr. al Kubesi closed his first, his first hole in a child's heart, he likened it to walking on the moon. And we're going to really appreciate hearing from Dr. Kubesi today. Jeremy Courtney, is a longtime partner of the Carter Center. Um, his Twitter handle is at jcourt. He is the founder and executive director of the Preemptive Love Coalition, an international development organization that provides life-saving surgeries to children and training to local doctors and nurses in an effort to unmake violence and remake the world in war-torn countries. He is the author of Preemptive Love. It's a title, both of his book and of his organization that I happen to think is fantastic and very spiritual um, and practical title. His book is Preemptive Love, Pursuing Peace, One Heart at a Time. And I know the book is still for sale um, and it's a really, really terrific book. I hope you'll pick it up. Um, and this is a firsthand account of his team's quest to mend hearts and save lives in the world's most notorious war-torn country. Sister Nadia Shamis is a member of the Dominican Congregation of St. Catherine of Siena in Mosul, Iraq. Before coming to the United States in 2005, Sister Nadia served as a nurse in her congregation's hospital in Baghdad, Iraq. <clears throat> Sister Nadia has recently completed her master's of clinical medical science, physician's assistant degree from Barry University in Miami, Florida. Sister Nadia plans to return to Iraq in late spring of 2015 to minister as a physician's assistant in Baghdad. Welcome to you, Sister Nadia. Sister Durstine Farnan is an American woman religious living in Michigan where she serves as vocation director for, a for the Adrian Dominican Sisters. A social worker by training, she has recently returned from a solidarity mission to Iraq, where she visited displaced communities and the health facilities run by Dominican Congregation of St. Catherine of Siena. Welcome to you all. We are so honored um, to hear from you today. And I'm going to start with a question for Dr. al -Kubesi. If you could tell us, uh, as you're, during your time in Fallujah um, in Iraq, can you tell us um, what it's been like working there? We know that you're not able to work there now. Um, so both in Fallujah, but where you're working now, tell us how it has changed over the last 12 years. What is the day-to-day -day work day like for you? And if you could describe the heart problems that you treat um, and the state of Iraq's national health infrastructure. Yeah. Why is there such a high prevalence of these birth defects 
in Anbar province in particular, if you could just talk to us about that. Thank you, Sarah, for this nice presentation. Uh, actually, I, I was working in Fallujah for many years as a pediatric cardiologist. Uh, in the last actually years, after the coalition invasion, we are living day by day, and we don't know whether the next day we can go back to our families or not. During my work in Fallujah, we established a cardiac center. And this was for the first time uh, in whole Ampar province. I have faced many, many thousands of uh, congenital heart diseases. Some of them, even I didn't read it in books. And I don't know why we don't find the, 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 the exact cause of these uh, many cases of congenital heart disease. We started our center in Fallujah. Actually, it was so difficult in the, for in the, in the, in the last years for us to work alone, to work in such a difficult uh, situation, and not in only in Ambar, but in whole Iraq. And this is actually started after the 2003, and especially in Fallujah, because the Fallujah, there was many military actions in 2004 and 2006, until now. I was the last time I went to Fallujah uh, in, actually in September, and after that, it was so difficult to go back to, to, to Fallujah. Uh, I lost actually many of my patients because we couldn't treat them. They couldn't go outside Fallujah to seek for help. Uh, many uh, congenital heart diseases, the uh, complex, the cyanotic, and the acyanotic congenital heart disease. VSD, VSD, the total anomalous pulmonary venous arrangement, the, the dog, many complex congenital heart disease we have faced. Uh, actually, we noticed that there is an increased incidence of congenital heart diseases in Fallujah. When I was when I was in, in Baghdad, uh, we saw uh, we what was a referral center for congenital heart diseases, and I noticed that many of these cases were coming from Fallujah. So when I went back to, to Fallujah, uh, I make uh, a special out uh, patient for the congenital heart diseases. And uh, it was actually more than 200 newly diagnosed cases per month. Uh, we don't know what was the cause. We tried to help them by all means. Uh, actually, um, uh, there was a lot of support from uh, the, 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 the government, we tried our best to help those uh, children. Now, many of our cases actually died. Many of them, uh, they don't know where to go and how to go. All the families lost their job, so they cannot pay to, to do the, the cardiac surgeries. The cardiac center now is actually is completely destroyed by the military actions. The Fallujah uh, hospital is targeted many times, more than 100 times, was targeted by the uh, missiles. Our uh, cardiac center actually was destroyed completely. Uh, most of my patients are scattered everywhere. Some of them stuck still in Ambar, some of them go outside uh, Ambar, but those who they can, they, uh, the, the families, you know, they, they, they lost their jobs, they, they have no money. To, uh, to, to treat their uh, children. So uh, actually it is um, a, a very bad now, very bad situation. Uh, and there's even no doctor there for to treat those uh, children. Well, this is quite dramatic. It's, it's almost difficult to, con to imagine um, how this is impacting your ability just even to practice your, your, your your, ba your basic health practice and the state of the, the health infrastructure in Iraq, you know, the ability to even organize basic care. Um, so we'll come back to you in a minute with a, a little bit more uh, question for that, uh, about that. Jeremy, maybe you can add here, you've been living um, now in Iraq for a long time with this work and you're, I know that your goal is to help, in fact, with this problem of rebuilding the health infrastructure and dealing with this catastrophic health situation. Um, so can you just talk about how you came up with this work, the idea for this work, 
Um, and how did you form the preemptive Lo love coalition? What motivated you to do that and to, to help to really help in this way? I think that will help our audience understand the scope of the, the challenge, but also the, you know, what we might all do. Your, your own story is an amazing story of service and also of a personal journey, really discovering what's happened and, and the role of our own nation, the American people, and what an individual can do to help. That's very kind of you, Karen. Thanks for saying that. Um, I guess by way of explanation and introduction, our story started much more simply and much more personally than this place where we've ended up. I, I was in Iraq, roughly the times that uh, Dr. Faraz here is referenced in 2006 at the height of what was the, the sectarian conflict here across Iraq. The last time when Shia militia and Sunni terrorist groups were really causing havoc in each other's neighborhoods, setting up mock checkpoints, killing each other in, in very difficult situations sometimes in the street. This was, this was when I entered Iraq and began getting to know its people for the first time. And the story I had of Iraq was, was the story that many of my friends in America still hold today. Somehow, this is probably all Iraq's fault. It's all Iraq's problems. Maybe there's, there's something inherently wrong with Arab people or there's something inherently wrong with Muslim people. This is what many of us thought where I come from. And it wasn't until I moved to Iraq and started meeting people like Dr. Faraz that I started to understand the situation much differently. So I was sitting in a hotel here in Iraq one day, and the guy who was to bring me a cup of chai, a cup of tea from the, the cafe, he kind of set my tea down on the table and asked me, Jeremy, you've been coming here to my cafe for a while now. Can I ask you a favor? And I said, absolutely. And so he went on to tell me about his cousin, this little girl, and he said she, she was born with this huge hole in her heart, and after all these years of Saddam's dictatorship and the UN sanctions against our country and now the, the war and terrorism. All of, so many of our doctors have been assassinated. The other doctors have fled the country. Our hospitals have been destroyed by bombs. The, the economy has been destroyed by the UN. And we really don't have any options left in the country to treat kids like my cousin. You're an American, obviously you came here to help. Can you help us? Can you get her the heart surgery that she needs? And at that time I didn't know anything about this. I, I didn't come to do that particular work. I kind of had a different lane of humanitarian service that I was in. And in an effort to figure out what that child would need and whether or not there was any way to help her, I started asking around, asking some questions. And one thing led to another and I, I came to find out that she wasn't alone. It wasn't just one little girl who was in this situation. It was hundreds of little girls across the country mm -hmm. like her. Thousands of kids we finally became aware of. As we started hearing these stories, Kurds would talk about Saddam Hussein's usage of mustard gas and how 5,000 people were killed on uh, March 16th, which is coming up when they remember Saddam's attack on Halabja. And Kurds would tell us that this mustard gas went on to affect tens of thousands of people and caused a, a high rate of birth defects among those communities that were gassed but did not die that day. And then we started meet, meeting friends from Baghdad and Fallujah and Basra who were saying a similar thing, only they weren't talking about Saddam. They were talking about American weapons. And, and I had never heard anyone say something like that before. I had never heard anyone suggest that American weapons might actually be part of the problem here. From my perspective, as a, as a patriot, as an American, all I knew was that American weapons were good. American weapons accomplished what they were supposed to accomplish. I had never heard kind of the other side of the story. And so when I started hearing that, my heart was really uh, tied to the hearts of these kids. And I just wanted to help do whatever we could to, to respond. And so over the last eight years now, we've been investing our lives and our resources in friends like Dr. Faraz and the good friends we have in Fallujah, trying to help them rebuild their heart center, trying to help them get the skills that they need to walk on the moon. 
as they say, you know, mm -hmm. to, to provide for these children. They're, they are the future of Iraq. It has little, nothing to do with us. We just want to help get the experts here that they need to train them so that they can, they can move this country forward. So it's been our honor to be here with friends like Dr. Faraz and, and our commitment is still to him. There's really nothing that's changed uh, about our commitment to this country over the last couple of months, even as ISIS has, has made it look like Iraq has no future. That's kind of the story you hear in America. It's not true. Iraq has a future and it's men like Dr. Faraz who are gonna lead it forward. And you're in Iraq, I won't say where, but you are in Iraq right now, right? Both of you. I just wanted to, to emphasize that. Um, and you said that, that Dr. Faraz and others like him are the future of Iraq. And I think this is so important to emphasize. <laughs> we had with us here um, a few weeks ago an amazing woman named Dr. Fatima al-Bahadli from Basra. And she's doing amazing work in Basra to, in fact, to dis disarm militants, uh, uh, you know, to, to put them to work building schools and paving roads instead of carrying weapons. Um, and so the, I think the women and the men together of Iraq are the, obviously the future of Iraq. So, so part of what we really are wanting to inquire here and to pursue and to talk about, not just today, but going forward, you know, we, keep, we will keep this conversation going. What can we do to really be in partnership with the people who are really going to build Iraq? You know, and, you know, this is always a balancing act. There's military action going on, but then you look at the people who are committed and, and prepared to stay and do the hard work of building. That's the story that we want to tell. Um, so thank you for that wonderful explanation. And Sister Durstein, if I could turn to you, you know, you've just returned from a trip uh, to visit the Dominican sisters in Erbil, in Erbil, Iraq. Uh, who are helping to provide the health care, to provide health care for the people displaced from the areas held by so-called um, ISIS. I say so-called because I don't like conferring state status on a bunch of, um, you know, armed groups that want to be considered a state, and I really don't want to go along with that plan, if you don't mind. So I, I say so-called um, ISIS. Um, and your background is in social work. Uh, can you describe for us the impacts of this conflict that you saw in terms of physical, psychological, emotional, and community health? And specifically, can you share what you saw in terms of the impact on the Christian and Yazidi communities of the kidnapping of women and girls and the impact on women of the lifestyle that has been forced on the displaced population? Can you talk to us about that? Well, that seems like a lot to talk about in a short amount of yes. time. Um, let me just say that uh, it was a, a powerful experience. It was my first time in Iraq. And uh, although we have had a long-term relationship with the Dominican Sisters of St. Catherine since at least 99, since several of the sisters, as you see, Sister Nadia here, um, have been with us and we've been trying to provide education that they they might need in order to go home and be of uh, even more service to their people. I would say, speaking now as a social worker, what I observed as the sisters took us from one camp to another um, in Erbil, Ankawa, and that surrounding area, and then to Duhok, which is about three hour drive further north uh, near the Turkish border. Um, what we saw was uh, an enormous amount of depression, uh, a great deal of sadness. The sisters described the faces of their friends in the community where most of these people come from Karakush. They described saying that they no longer recognize them because the face is different. Mm. So it's because of, partly because of the depression and also a great deal of anxiety, meaning are we safe? Will we be safe? Can we stay here? Do we need to leave? Um, shall we leave? I mean, this, these questions, what do we do today? What do we do tomorrow? Is constantly on their mind. Um, the other thing is that in spite of the depression, um, there is 
as uh, both Dr. Farrakh and Jeremy have mentioned, is there is a sense of of hope, and I think that's because the Christian community is uh, a, a very deeply faithful community, and it's it's their faith that gives them enough hope to say, I can move from today till tomorrow. When we visited the Yazidi community in Dohok, these are the people who came from Mount Sinjar. There are thousands of them in mm -hmm. the Dohok area, and they are still living in tents. I don't know what the weather is like today in March, but in January, there was snow everywhere, mm -hmm. and they're still living in tents, huge tents, 40 people to a tent, uh, 12,000 people in one small area, 3,000 tents. But in another little area, just on the other side, outside of the hook called um, Sharia, uh, where, where the Yazidis are in camp, the Catholic Relief Service people have been able to establish a relationship with some landlords who had some unfinished homes. And so they did a bargain for two winters if we put in windows and doors and roofs on your unfinished home, can the Yazidis stay? And they said yes. So the CRS trained the uh, Yazidis how to put in the windows and, and et cetera. Mm. As I was talking to them, I saw a group of small children and I wondered maybe if I could invite them to sing a song or tell me something, maybe joyful. Well, standing next to me was the father of, of, um, of some of the children. And he said to me, we will not sing until our 5,000 women and girls return to us. Oh, wow. Very painful. And I so apologize for, of course, how can you sing? when your women and children have been taken away. Mm -hmm. There are still children being born in these camps. We saw a brand new uh, three-month-old baby. Um, uh, you know, I think what Americans need to know is that I had the pleasure of living outside of the United States for many years as well, but in Africa, children are children. I don't care where they come from. They sing songs, they dance, and thank God for children because I will say this, among the Christians and the Yazidis, it's the children that are helping the parents get from day to day because the children um, have a different kind of resiliency than maybe we as adults have. But there's no doubt that there's uh, the potential from a health perspective, of a lot more health issues coming forward because um, I'm afraid that because of the cold and the conditions that people are living in, they don't have the immediate hot water. They don't have the immediate medicines that they need. I learned when I was there that 40% of the medications in Iraq are fake. Mm. So when pharmacists are trying to give medicine, in which the sisters have established two clinics now, one in, in Erbil and in a sub, another suburb of Erbil called Tazna Khan, they set up two clinics. Mm -hmm. And all the Christians and others who are um, mm -hmm. medical personnel are giving their time, like Dr. Faraz, they're not getting paid for anything. They are being their, their physicians, their pharmacists, their nurses, their um, um, technicians of some kind from a medical field, they're all pitching in to help so that the people get as much medical care as they possibly can at this time. Uh, they see 400 to 500 patients every morning from 9 to 12 in both of these clinics. And um, well, can I ask you what are the main what are why the shortage of resources in in that area that seems to be 
accessible um, according, you know, compared to other areas that may not be as accessible? What is the, what's the problem with getting adequate and quality medications and, and, and equipment and, and personnel? Well, I think it's like in many war-torn areas, things are easily confiscated uh. as they come into the country. They land in the hands of other people. And so when they go to get the medicine, which they think are legitimate, they're not. Wow. And I can't say all the reasons why, uh, it, but we know that it's very difficult uh, for things to reach. Now, there are other organizations who are really helping a lot, and that's the Catholic Near East Welfare Association, who is helping, and they have helped to establish these clinics. Um, but all the same, you're never sure if the medicine you have is the medicine you have, <laughs> is what wow. it says. That's, a, that's incredible. Uh, Sister Nadia Shamis, let me bring you in here. I know that you've been doing your own training uh, in order to prepare to return to Iraq. So as you're, as you're listening to this discussion, give us your reflections as a young professional uh, who, is, who is preparing to serve in so many different capacities um, mm -hmm. when you return. You have, you know, you, you, I, I'm just wondering what's going through your mind <laughs> as you're listening to this discussion. What do you hope when you go back, what, what, what do you see as the, the challenges, but also the opportunities? I think we've heard a little bit about the, the courage and determination of the Iraqi people. But tell us, what do you think? And, and what can you tell the American public about how we can support what, what you imagine to be the, the work going forward? Um, you, Sister Nadia, you need, we need you to unmute your, your microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, but I have not been in Iraq for about five years ago. Yeah. But I have people, I always communicate, my families and my sisters in, in Iraq, Baghdad, they have the hospitals and my family members also, they are doctors and nurses at the same time. As you're talking, everybody like uh, Dr. Um, Karaz and Dusty about what was going uh, on in Iraq, about the health care. It's not only about uh, people are sick, but there is uh, low nutrition, education is low. Um, there is no adequate and uh, prepared doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals at this time of the year. All the people, most of the doctors are leaving Iraq because they are afraid of kidnapping, afraid of being killed, afraid of being uh, killed by uh, their children being killed. So they are uh, looking for a better place to live. But how can we help these people? Is Are we able to train enough young men and women to be able to stay in Iraq and to help the Iraqi in healthcare? Are we able to train them, to give them the opportunity to come and study if they are willing to go back and stay there and help their people? Of course, there's too many things going on in my mind right now. When I go to Iraq, am I able to do what I want to do? Am I able to be able to go to uh, a poor area that can help the children? And there is too many things going in my mind. Is the people going to help me to build a driving clinic that could help children in their first area that may not able to go to the hospital or poor area? I am a maternity um, labor. I was a labor and delivery nurse before, but in, also worked in a clinic for the children, which really helped me to be more touched to the children than in a women's health but it doesn't mean that I cannot work both of them. But I would love to be more training um, for the people in Iraq. More training. So that's very, that's very helpful. And, and, and I, I would like to, I guess, bring uh, Dr. Firas and Jeremy back in also here because, okay, so we know that what most of the American public, you all might not, Dr. Faraz, be as as in as sort of aware of the discussion that's happening in the U.S., 
but it's very focused on what military action the United States should or should not take to defeat ISIS. This is the this is the question that is uh, preoccupying the the, Amer the American public. So I'm thinking, okay, well, at least if you're if you're talking about that, shouldn't we also be in some kind of equal way saying what resources will be required to make sure that the health infrastructure can be built, not through dollars going to American or European contractors uh, doing the, the rebuilding, because we've seen that this money has, has not reached. Many, many government reports even have shown that the money that the American taxpayers have allocated for that purpose have not reached the purpose, have not have succeeded in, in doing this rebuilding. So if you can tell us, give us some practical ideas about what is needed, how many physicians, how, you know, if, if we compare, you know, I, I the story about Dr. about uh, Fatima, the woman in Basra that I mentioned, she had five thousand dollars. She used five thousand dollars to disarm and hire. 500 men who were in militias to turn in their weapons and rebuild roads and houses and schools, $5,000. And you just think about how many billions uh, in military we have poured in that couldn't achieve this, you see. So I'm, I'm asking, give us some practical suggestions about what could be done right now just for this immediate need for physicians, for equipment, for uh, uh, medication, but also for, you know, what about the distribution system? How can, it, you know, good quality medications be properly distributed to uh, you, uh, Dr. Faras, and other re well-known, re reputable healthcare workers and organizations, Iraqi groups that can do the, the care? What, what can you tell us about this? <clears throat> Actually, uh, uh, first in Fallujah Hospital, we were more than uh, 1,000 uh, doctors and medical staff, and now what remains in Fallujah Hospital is not more than 10 people. Oh. And those 10 people who are trapped in Fallujah, they are, if they can't go outside, they will. But actually, they are trapped, trapped in Fallujah. And uh, we have doctors who were killed, actually. And, and one month ago, one of our colleagues, he was a doctor in Fallujah, he was an orthopedics, he was killed. And two of our other, other doctors were kidnapped and they were threatened. If you were go again to Fallujah, you would be killed. So actually, inside Fallujah, the situation now is very bad. We cannot do anything. We have first. The, we have the we have the doctors, we have the staff, but nobody can go there. So, if we now want to to help those people, we have to have a safe place. Whether inside Fallujah, they have to open a safe place for us, and then we can go, or they have to have another alternative place, and then we can coordinate with all of us. All doctors, not only from Fallujah, are ready to 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 give help to people and to children. But we want a safe place, okay? We uh, we can arrange for the for the uh, for the, for the medicines. We have you know we have to provide another equipment for my specialty. I have to have a, a new eco machine. We have to have a, a CAD lab. Actually, we lost all of these, and uh, so actually for the situation now it's so difficult. Uh, uh, Sister uh, Christine, when she said that there are many of uh, people in uh, tents in a very small area. Actually, in Fallujah, the, the situation is more difficult because those people in Fallujah now, even there is no uh, home. They're, they are in the, in the uh, just in the streets. They are living in the streets. They are trapped in, and they are under the military actions every day. And as I had, I heard yesterday, there was uh, more than 20 victims yesterday just in Fallujah, and most of them were. Uh, women and uh, children. So, uh, you know, we have first to have a safe place 
and then we have to uh, provide help for um, for the children and for all families. And, and just to, just to ask one question about that, I think again in the perception of the public, you have this um, uh, ice this group Daesh ISIS whatever we want to call them um, on one side where there is this uh, they have been carrying out terrible um, acts that they've publicized on YouTube. Um, and so there is a, a great awareness of their, you know, terrible, uh, th their actions that are quite brutal. Um, but I understand also that this isn't, it isn't just that side of the conflict that is carrying out uh, atrocities. We understand that uh, from human rights organizations have been documenting that uh, the other side of that conflict, which uh, is including, you know, other sectarian groups that are fighting ISIS, so-called ISIS, are also carrying out terrible atrocities. So is there, if, if, if we have this need for a safe space to create, to insist on the creation of safe space, yet it, we're caught, you're caught right on the front line of a battle. So as we think about whether more military force is the way to end that conflict or the way to deal with this problem, I'm wondering, you know, what is the way? You know, we, there, there is this feeling that we have to do something to deal with ISIS taking over more territory, et cetera. Yet it, there are more, there's more than one bad guy in this scenario. So it's not that it's all one bad guy and that the forces of good are on the other side, if you know what I mean. So um, I'm, I'm, this is what, where we get stuck, I think, in terms of what to do. Um, so we have two, two, really two big questions. One is how to help you very practically now. You've just told us that there are doctors, that there are people ready to work, but they don't have safe areas. That's one thing. Um, doc, and Sister Durstein mentioned we got we have to distribute quality medications, et cetera, through some system. So those are very immediate things. But also, as we're talking about that, what about this, um, you know, th this problem of uh, of the outside world, you know, feeding into the conflict? Is that really going to get us where we want to go? Are there other ways that communities are trying to respond in nonviolent ways to de-escalate the conflict between the sides? Um, does anyone have any thoughts about that? Jeremy, do you wanna talk about that? Or is there, I'm just asking how we, how we think about this both in the immediate sense of, of taking care of the immediate needs, but also what's the solution? Where do we, how do we get uh, to a place where there are safe spaces and we can grow those safe spaces and we can try other methods of, of, of dealing with this conflict? Well, I think one of the interesting things that has emerged in America since the National Prayer Breakfast a couple of weeks ago is a, a kind of sub-conversation or a subset of the conversation that is acknowledging that where religion on some level is the problem, religion has to be engaged, leveraged, used as the solution. You can't, you can't take what is, have, has largely become a religiously rhetorical, ideological engagement on both sides, quite frankly. I mean, every time a, a white American pastor friend of mine speaks up and says something inflammatory about all Muslims, he is engaging in a similar kind of religious um, isolationism and, and bigotry and a similar kind of rhetorical violence that the fundamentalist Islamist ISIS types are. And so this has in some ways been executed, the, these conflicts and some of these things have been executed in religious terms what, what many would have us do then is blame all religion, throw religion aside, and seek to solve this conflict and its various sub-conflicts through secular means, as they would probably call them. So guns are agnostic, tanks are agnostic, 
diplomacy is agnostic and, and we should just leave religion out of this. That is clearly not working. And I think one of the interesting conversations that is finally finding its way into some hearts and some spaces over the last couple of weeks is that if this is a religious problem, which clearly it is, we have to engage religion and, and work through this faithfully, religiously, with our doctrines, with our beliefs on the table. And so to do that, it's something that we're already doing here. I mean, faith is, is fully integrated into Dr. Faross's life, into my life. You know, we don't, we don't, when we come to work, we don't say we're no longer a Muslim or we're no longer a Christian. We come together and work together, fully Muslim, fully Christian, to work together. And, and I think that's one of the things that has to be engaged here more, more robustly is we have to, as the diplomatic corps, the military, uh, Iraqi politicians here, humanitarians, have to become less allergic to faith and religion and have to learn to work together as faithful people, as religious people. And, and so we have to bring Muslim leaders to the table and we have to bring Christian leaders to the table. And we have to bring Yazidi leaders to the table and Sunni and Shia you know, subgroups of Islam have to work hand in hand here in Iraq. And, and quite frankly, that's happening. I don't say this as though I'm introducing something new into the world. It's happening. It's just something that is not largely reported on in America. And so the American, um, the American mind is often left bereft of creativity and bereft of options other than guns and tanks. Yes, and I think that's a wonderful way to frame this, because if we want an ongoing conversation, if, if we want to think of today's discussion as just at the beginning of, of, of a discussion among us and others about what do we do, then let's build on that idea of building mutual respect, coming out of the I, what I think is just this almost irresistible frame that people fall into, which is good versus evil. Um, it, it, it really, you know, the, we can go back to the original war, uh, the, 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 the early 1990s, the first Iraq war and the destruction of the infrastructure and, and, and how, how everything fed into each other and our own part in that as a nation. So I think good versus evil just certainly doesn't work in this scenario. So if we can start there and begin to build relationships and and talk about what's working, like what you all are involved in, in building and not destroying. Maybe we can pull more people into the conversation about building um, and resisting the, the temptation to destroy. Um, Dr. Faras, did you want to add anything to that? Um, thoughts about, about this question, about how to go forward and um, those both the practical, but also the lot more long-term discussion about how we get out of this. Yes, actually, uh, I uh, agree with the journey. We have to have to be together. We have to be united. We have to have we have to have the same aim. We have to do uh, 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 we have to do the same things that everybody knows that uh, the. Uh, uh, education, the united, we have to be united, the, the Muslims, the Christians, everybody, for the help of this country, for the, uh, for the sake of uh, the children, to the, the Sunni, the Shi'i, the, the Muslims, the, the Christians, everybody, we have to be united. Actually, the, the, the decision is more political than it is real. Between the Sunni and Shi'a, the, the usual families, the, the usual people, they don't have any problem between others. And even the Muslims and the Christians, they are living here together since many years. And there is nothing. Actually, it is, it is a political thing. It's rather than a real thing in the ground. Yes. And, and the question is, how do we build that? Let's build. How do we rebuild those relationships again? And, and Sister Durstein, can you comment on this? Um, I think... Jeremy made a wonderful point about engaging religion and, and coming from a religious frame and this commitment to service that really is deep in every religious tradition. You're coming from that, that frame and, and you see it, I think, through, through those eyes of a faithful person. 
So how would you help us both with both of these? I, I want to stay focused on the practical immediate needs and also this longer term vision of how do we get out of this? Well, I, I think that one thing that Dr. Faraz said that's very important. I So many times the sister said, we, we have lived side by side for decades, yeah. centuries. Yeah. And we never had this incredible difficulty that we have now. I, I firmly believe it's one of the tactics of war. One of the things that war does is try to separate people from one another rather than unite them. If that's what Dr. Faraz is talking about, forever these just people have lived together side by side and somehow have tried to build a rest. So I think, again, what we will have to do, though, is build a new trust among one another. Trust that one another, all we will all want, we all people want is to live in um, peace and in harmony with one another because all people have the right for peace and harmony and good health. And so I think we have to foster that. I think we have to also continue to develop from our, my tradition anyway, one of the things that we're looking at since coming back from Iraq is trying to develop an understanding of what is post-war just theory, not the just theory of when it's time to drop the bomb, but what, what is the residual of war? And I think Dr. Faraz and Jeremy are seeing it, the sisters in, 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 in uh, in uh, Erbil now, they've been displaced, they're seeing it, is that um, we think it's just the immediate dropping of a bomb that, that that's all there is to war. What happens in war is that families are separated. Look at how many of the families have had to leave Iraq because of safety. Now they are a diaspora all over the world. They're living in Sweden, they're living here in the US, they're living in Australia, they're living in France. And so we all, so one of the aspects of war is that we separate families from one another. This is this huge issue in the United States right now about immigration reform. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's all connected in some way. We have to find ways to keep people united, not separated. And whether that's either down a religious line or any other line. So we have to find some ways to bring about security in Iraq. That's, that's paramount. If there's no sense of safety, then you, if you can't live. You don't live well. You just add to the anxiety. You add to the depression. You add to the hopelessness that could be prevailing, pre prevailing at this time. Yeah. So I think we we need, uh, as Dr. Faraz said, safe zones. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that really means, practically speaking, mm -hmm. but I do know that we need to create some kind of safe zone. Right. And people have to stay true to their promise. People say, we are going to protect you, then you must protect them. You can't just abandon them, as what happened in uh, Karakush, August 6th. People said they were going to protect them, so they thought they were safe until they realized that there was nobody, no one was going to protect them. So they had to leave in the middle of the night. Mm. Some were walking, some were driving. What took, should have taken an hour, took 10 hours to get from Karakush to Ankawa Erbia. So we have got to stay true. So how we set up these safe zones, I don't know. I'm not that good at all that. Yeah. Kind of, but I think that that's part of it. Um, I wonder, can I, I ask? Uh, that's a great point. And uh, Sister Nadia, maybe you can help us. I know that you're going back. Um, you're hoping to go back and, and contribute to this. And, and the question is, you know, sometimes there can be a bridge between health between something very practical like providing health care for people that presumably everybody uh, should be concerned with on all sides of a conflict right. and, and you know is there a way that 
by rebuilding the healthcare infrastructure gradually, but also in very in this very specific, the Sister Durstein, creating safe zones maybe that we're using um, health clinics and and uh, uh, health some kind of health safe zone could be a way to be to do some of this peace building um, in a very practical way where you could actually get the parties to to engage on this very practical question. Um, that's one may, maybe one way to do it. Sister Nadia, do you have any thoughts about about this, about how, you know, how this is, uh, all the discussions that we've had earlier, you know, this is, I'm thinking, I keep thinking about you because you are, you are, are you have your whole future ahead of you and you're, I'm sure that this is what you think about a lot is how to do it. Um, so can we build a bridge between health and peace? I think we can, but always I said, people when they go to the war, they destroy everything. But do we think we're destroying humanity or we destroying all these buildings? Mm -hmm. if, if American government were able to take Saddam Hussein down, they are able to build peace in that place. Whatever it takes, they had time where they had a green zone for their own hospital for the Americans and nobody touched that green zone. They can build a green zone for Iraqi people too, mm. if they want. I don't know how, but there is, I'm very sure there is a solution for that. People in Iraq are desperate for peace, desperate to live together as they used to be living together. I, when I was in my nursing school in Iraq, I had 40 students with me Sunni, Shia, Yazidi, and I was the only Christian Iraqi there. And I never felt protected like that time, during, during that time I was with them. I was like so protected by them. Nobody can touch me or do anything to me. That's where we Iraqi people are living together with peace. Sunni, Shia, Christian, Yazidi. I never know there was Sunni and Shia until 2003 of war, there is the in Iraq. Mm -hmm. but we were living together. We take care of everyone. There is no discrimination. But if we were able, if the American government willing to help really Iraqi in a health care, they are able to do so. That's all I can say. Jeremy, what do you, yeah, yes, that, Sister Justine, go ahead. Sorry. I just want to say, I think your question about how to help bridge that, you know, the Sisters Hospital in Baghdad, which is still there, thank God, <laughs> and did not get bombed like uh, Dr. Faraz's cardiac hospital. Everyone is welcome. I think that phrase, all are welcome. It's a great Christian song, too. All are welcome. When we think, say that, there's no discrimination, as Sister Nadia said, when it comes to health care. All people deserve the right to good health. And, and I do believe this is a great peacemaking tool, if that's the right word, or effort. This, this is how peace will be made. And this is what is happening. And there were both, um, so I, I just wanted to confirm that, that's all. No, that's wonderful. Dr. Faraz, can you, can you uh, and Jeremy, both of you, we only have about six more minutes. So I wanna, since you're in Iraq, I, I wanna give you both a chance to, to wrap it up for us here to tell us about this. I mean, so what can, can health, the re building of health and health, just this very, very human need, this very basic human need, really be a bridge to peace? Can we, can we see it that way? And what are your parting thoughts about how to deal with the immediate situation of escalating conflict? Um, both of those questions, let me just leave it to you there, both of you. Dr. Uh, Faraz. Yes, actually I think that, and I insist that the war in Iraq is political, it's rather than religious. So if everything is solved, if the, if the, if the politici politicians 
okay? Make friends, okay? No, nothing will be happening in Iraq. So at this moment, at this moment, as far as there is still a war, uh, from, let's say, talk about my, my, my side, it's actually so difficult for now. We can do nothing. Uh, the, the chances are very low to do anything in Ambar. Uh, if we have to, to give help for uh, people, to, to, uh, we have, as we say, we have to have a safe zone, a safe place, and then we can do many things to them. Uh, I'm doing, I'm totally now, you know, I'm now in the north of Iraq, it is a relatively safe area. I'm doing a lot of things to my old patients yeah, um, by many means. If they can come here, I will do, I can. Uh, help them, I can send them to, to, to another doctor, to another institutions, to, I can guide them to do a lot of things, I can help them, I solve a lot of uh, problems and I even treat a lot of patients even by phone, personally by phone, okay, mm -hmm. because we lost connection between those patients. So actually, uh, uh, just we want a safe place and we can help all the people here. Yes. Jeremy? Yeah, I, I see it a little bit differently from for Dr. Faraz in this way. He feels like he's doing nothing right now to end the conflict. And I just, I think that's not true. I think he's <laughs> actually doing quite a bit. And, you know, sometimes we imagine that it's these huge actions that have to be taken to change the world or to change the nature of things. And, and there's a place for that, to be sure. But, but sometimes in our activism, we imagine that we have to be actively doing something. Um, and sometimes there's a place for just not making things worse. And, and part of what he's doing right now, in the very least, is not making things worse. He's continuing to serve people. One thing I know about him, because I've spent a lot of time with him, is that when a child arrives in his office, he doesn't ask, where are you from? What neighborhood? Uh, what's your family's name? Can you tell me your religion or what sect you're from? He doesn't do that. And by not doing that, by treating the person in front of him the same exact way that he treated the person in front of him before, he's, he's doing something. He's actually remaking the world. If this family just came through a checkpoint where their last name was checked or their tribal name was checked and they were threatened or they were treated horribly, and he treats them differently, he's actually re-instilling their faith that they could have. So they, they come to the checkpoint, they're angry, they're, they're more susceptible to violence, they're more susceptible to someone kind of stoking the fires of sectarianism in them, and then they sit with him, and he treats their child with love, and mm -hmm. he heals their child, and he's rebuilding their world, really rebuilding their faith. So I get why it feels like nothing to him, but I have the privilege of, of kind of standing by and watching what a profound work it is. And so this, this whole idea of first do no harm in medicine, I think has a lot of applicability here in the peacemaking realm mm -hmm. as well. And then the way that, that medicine tends to treat people like, uh, like what's said, as though all are, are welcome or in its effort to treat um, root causes and to look at symptoms rather than to look at, uh, you know, sectarian issues or, or whatever, it allows us to treat people as people. And, and I know that's what Dr. Faraz sees. He doesn't see a Sunni or a Shia or an Arab or a Kurd or a Christian. He sees a child. And, and that's what I'm so privileged to, to be able to partake in with him every day that we get to spend time together. So I, I don't think he's doing nothing. I don't think medicine is doing nothing. I think it's a phenomenal way to unmake violence and actually remake the world through healing. Well, Jeremy, that's great. And let me ask you, as an American in, in Iraq, what would you want to say to the American public about how to not do harm, how to do no harm, how to not do the wrong thing, what, what, how to do the right thing? What should we as a community, as a, as a nation, how should we be dealing with it, looking at this problem right now and thinking what well, how would you how would you guide us being there and seeing that the costs but also the problem when we do when we don't think do no harm when we don't have that in our mind 
what what message would you like to leave us with and, and you'll be our last speaker as we conclude i'm learning to take a 30 to 50 year view of things and our political systems in america are not geared toward that when we have elections every couple of years cable news cycles every 24 hours we're, we're geared toward ginning up some kind of drama so that we can run on it for our next round of sweeps or our next round of political activity. And, and that causes us to think that we have to do something really big right now because the whole world is about to die. And I think that that, that can discourage us from smaller, more faithful, long-term view of what needs to happen. And so mm -hmm. here's the point. What I think we need to do to protect Iraq as Americans right now, one thing that we need to do as, as white Christians like me, for example, is we need to love our Muslim neighbors better in Atlanta and in New York City and in Washington, D.C. That's actually one of the things that we can do to make sure that Iraq 30, 50 years from now is not subject to our same kind of knee jerk reactions, because if we all have better, stronger friendships with each other across religious divides, then when, when we have our next conflict, we won't be so susceptible to thinking that, oh, all Muslims are bad, so we have to go do this dramatic action in Iraq to protect ourselves. We'll know better because we will have Muslim friends and we will have on the other side, Christian friends or Sunni friends or Shia friends or whatever, whatever the issue is. And, and we have it domestically in our own policy and issues as well. So that's one thing, I think, to protect Iraq, make Muslim friends in your own neighborhood. That's not too small a thing. And then secondly, I would say, support the organizations that are here on the ground so that we can continue to do whatever we deem best to do in partnership with friends like Dr. Faraz, in partnership with the communities that have been referenced in Ankoa and Erbil and Kasnazan. We can, we can all, the Catholic charities and and Preemptive Love Coalition and others like us, we can continue to live our lives here, present, pushing back darkness with this kind of love that drives out fear. Well, I, I think that's a beautiful way to end, Jeremy. You've given us um, a lot to think about. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Firas, you, Sister Nadia, and you, Sister Durstein, for being with us, and you, Jeremy, also. As we go forward, keep, continue to follow us. We're going to keep this conversation going. We promise not to drop it. We're gonna keep it going. So thank you very much for participating in our roundtable today.